three things we're going to cover today. Um, pretty basic, I think, and ties in everything that Luke talked about. Sorry, in general, everything you need to know about your business or what everyone wants to know is number one, how are you going to make it? Production, how's it actually going to get to the customer? That's what Joe's going to come in and talk about. Number two, how are you going to sell it? I've been self employed since I was 23, and what you learn absolute first off is if you cannot get and keep a customer, that is sell it, you don't have a business. All right, number three, how do you manage the money? So the money that comes in to fund the business, the money that comes in from revenues, whatever that's gonna be, and that's gonna be the third part of what today is about. So how do you make it, how do you sell it, and how do you manage the money that comes in? I'm gonna focus on how do you sell it <coughs> part, and obviously we're gonna take a broad view of that and do it from a marketing perspective, broad-based marketing planning. Now, I can be quick or I can be gentle. It's hard to be both at the same time. So let's do the quick thing. I have an hour. I'd like to do, get to the material here in about 30, 40 minutes maybe and leave the rest of it for Q&A. Just because I think one thing when you're looking at the slides and going through it is quite another as I'm sure you're going to deal with when you're trying to put Luke's uh, four steps together. It's not quite so simple when you actually have to sit down and do it. So we're going to go through right, the difference here between what you had to do for the first part of it a little bit, which was the, the due diligence of is there a market demand, is there really demand out there? We're gonna come out to here, and what we're gonna talk about here. So you were previously asked to look at your customers, describe your competition, what's your advantage, look at your success factors, and all that stuff that we do in a, in a very nice, perfect academic way. We're gonna come back down to here today. Look at this idea of branding and positioning. We'll talk about pricing, talk about distribution and sales, a bit, talk about the communication and sales process, just sort of piece by piece, all right? Please feel free to interrupt as I go along. I'm gonna have to just go through this as a, as a part. So first off, and again back to one of Luke's um, references here, um, it, it's one thing in your little pitch to say that, gee, this applies to people that are on the move. Um, that's not gonna actually help you sell it. You still have to find those initial customers. You have to find a way to sell and distribute to them. You have to find a way to put a communication message out there. And the more targeted you can be in the beginning, the better off. Right. Everyone today looks at Facebook and says a billion users. Right. Facebook started where? Harvard, in a college dorm. And they had how many users when they started? I have no idea, it doesn't matter. Right. They went from Harvard to where? <coughs> another college and they went to another <coughs> college and they went to another college and like five years later they had a hundred universities and colleges but they did it piece by piece step by step right and they targeted it nationally and then they went international and they had a whole process and a plan to make no mistake they started with one place right so absolutely right you have to have a big picture here you have to know where you're going to go but you need to start with a target segment because it has to be accessible, it has to be something that you can view with in regards to your relatively limited resources. You only have so much time, you can only make so many calls to be able to actually get this thing kicked off here. So have the big thing, make the, the description of who you want, but everyone's gonna wanna know where you're gonna start because you have to have the first sale, right? So where are you gonna get your first customer from? What do they look like? And then how are you gonna take that first customer or early customers and actually move forward? And all that is this idea of limited resources, again, this right size piece. I don't know how many business plans I've read. Um, market segmentation. Here, here's what I ultimately want you to be able to convey to yourself and to anyone who's listening to you. And that means the written plans and then the pitches as you go along. Is, is the process of segmenting your marketplaces is fundamentally about getting at the end of the process and better understanding your customers. Right? It's not a slide in a PowerPoint deck. It's not that we're going to target females 18 to 24 years of age who live in this and have this income level and this education. That's nothing. It's just nothing. Right? What we want to be able to have when you're done right, and you're, someone else is reading it is a clear picture of this person's life. Right? I, I want to have a picture. Right, what I want to be able to say is, gee, that's not me. Right, I'm not the target audience here, but I should know who that target audience is. Right, and it is probably one of the most difficult things to do. Everything else you do is going to fall out of that picture. Right, the understanding of where they are and who they are and what they do and how you can improve their lives, it, it all comes out of the segmentation. So just 
point of better understanding um, is the critical component here. I'm more interested in the end result than I am kind of the format of what classical segmentation looks like. I'm going to take you through that bit, but all in relation to better understanding your customers. Now, this idea of it being measurable, um, it's going to come up when you say, this is who we're going after. And someone is going to ask you how big that segment is. And they're going to want to know, can I actually put a number to it? It needs to be significant enough. How much advertising spent in the United States today? Broad-based media. $300 billion, give or take. How much of it's online? 10 or 15% of those budgets today. Right? 90% of all purchases of consumer product today is done in brick and mortar stores. Right? Only 10% goes to online. But you have to have context here. You have to have the numbers. Now, is 10% of $300 billion a lot of money? And don't be afraid of, of narrowing this thing down. It's $30 billion plus dollars, right? And it's growing. And you can't be afraid here of being too narrow. It's not possible, really. Idea, again, being able to capture it. <coughs> Needs to be large enough. I think you're not going to have any trouble. Recognizable, distinct, that I know that these people, who they are, come back to what I said. And again, that it's compatible with what it is that you can actually do. Right, and that's the fourth step that Luke took you through that sort of how I'm going to do it. And Joe's going to take you through a lot of detail there when he's up here about actually understanding the operations of your business. So it's one thing to say, here's who I'm going to target. It's quite another to be able to make the connection that I can actually access these people. I can deliver the value that I say I'm going to deliver. I can sell them the service and product on down the line. Am I making sense here? Right, so it's the connections that are so important. And it really all starts here with segmentation. All right, now. Yeah. Always a little reluctant. This is the this is the textbook way of doing segmentation. This is the PowerPoint slide I told you you shouldn't have. You're gonna have to have it though. Again, because it just sets up some expectations. Geographic description. Right. Now come back to what I said about the end result of segmentation. It's supposed to culminate in you better understanding your customers. How, how does describing your markets geographically help you with that? Well, what information do you get when you say, gee, I'm going to target people who live in urban areas or suburban areas, or I'm going to target people in India, or I'm going to target people in the United States, or the West Coast or the East Coast, or any kind of geographic cut that you can make? How is that helping you understand your customers? What information is contained in there? Geographically, you know roughly what the traffic patterns are like, what the weather is, depending on how you sort of yeah, It captures a ton of information. Captures climate, captures infrastructure, captures at some level culture. In some way, you might argue or worry about that it's stereotype. Come on, that stuff exists for a reason. Right? Stereotypes are based on people's history and patterns and expectations, right or wrong, good or bad. It captures that. So let's say you're going to go do business in Japan, and you talk to anyone who's done business in Japan, and they'll go, oh, yeah, I get it. Right? 30 ways to say yes, and none of them mean yes. Right? Consensus building. It's going to take a long time to make decisions. There's a ton of information. Is it sufficient? No. Is it necessary? Yes. Right? Infrastructure, sales, money. You have to have a geographic description. But it's incredibly minor. Right? It's incredibly minor here. Right? Next thing down, demographic. And you, unfortunately, again, I think are going to need to have some demographic information. One of the beauty of so much online stuff today is it tends to cut across a lot of demographics, right? And you can describe it as people who have internet access, people who have, um, <coughs> well, that probably covers most of it, actually. Um, homes, offices, and businesses. Think about the different ways that you can cut this thing demographically. What's the importance of demographic data? Why does anyone care about income? And why should you care about it? Um, that's what's going to eventually become your Online, right? Yeah, I need a piece of it. Well, I need a piece of it. I, I just want a small piece, right? Share a wallet or however you want to look at it, but well, if you can't describe the incomes, then I can't be sure that someone can actually afford to pay for the money that I want to charge them, right? Whether that's again, share of advertising revenues, something like that. All right, how else does demographic data or do demographic data help you? Now, we're talking about age and income and education levels and gender and how does all that stuff manifest itself in a better understanding of your customers? Interest. You mean to tell me that men or women are different? 
men to different than women to have different needs <coughs> by definition, I guess. Right. Buy different products, have different attitudes. Come on, it gets captured that way. I'm in my 60th year. That's scary. I have different interests than you. I suspect I have a lot of common interests too, but. Everyone's always wondering, everyone's always questioning about whether or not those things are different enough that they're going to be important. Right? Just think it through. No, you just scratch it. Be careful. It's like an auction in here. So if you start doing things, I'm going to call on you. Okay. Now, let's get down to the last two because I think this is really where you start to have a real insight in, into segments and markets. And the first is psychographic, um, things like values. Lifestyles, um, hobbies. Um, I'm, I'm a, I like to fish. I know it seems a little surprising to some people. I don't know why. I like to fish. Um, I don't dress like this one. But my dad fishes. My son fishes. My dad's 88, almost 89. Lives in Florida, still fishes regularly. My son's 32, lives in California. He fishes regularly. I told you I'm almost 60. And I like to fish. You cannot find a single commonality that we have geographically or demographically. Not a single thing. Right? So you wouldn't put us in a segment together because we have nothing in common. <coughs> segments, again, these people have a set of things in common. What's common for us is this. When it comes to selling us a fishing trip or selling us fishing equipment or something like that. Um, come to your fish. Go out early Saturday morning. Right? Get away. Take your fishing pole. A couple hours, come back. Neighbor sees you after you go on fishing, and what's the first thing they ask you? Catch you anything? Always. Always. Anyone who sees you with a fishing pole will say, are you catching it? Usually I'll say, no, I didn't catch anything. And then what do they say? No, come on, what do, they, what do they say? No, I didn't catch anything. Oh, that's too bad. I don't care. No, it, it, it's not too bad. I don't go fishing to catch fish. I go fishing for what? No, why do you go fishing? Some beers. Bring some beer. <laughs> <laughs> be with your buddies. For me, be with my son. Um, get the hell out of Dodge for two hours. You know, no phone, no nothing. You know, it's really great. Catching fish, fishing. Like it. I like when I catch fish. It's always nice to say, yeah, I caught a big one. Comes up with nothing to do with it. Nothing to do with it. If you run an ad that says, gee, come to our lake and you'll catch more fish than you've ever caught in your life, oh, my dad, and we don't care. That's work. That's just work to catch that many fish. We go fishing because of all the other reasons. Same fish, same lake, same operation, same everything. Message of come to our lake and you will be all alone for a week. Right? You'll see more moose, more deer, more elk, hear more loons than you've ever heard in your life. Right? We're there. Because right? that's the reason we go. Do we catch a lot of fish? Yeah, we catch a lot of fish. Completely different. You see the difference? Same, same thing. Right? But if you don't understand this, if you don't understand why at the root someone is actually doing something, the rest of this stuff is meaningless. It's just meaningless. You've got to bring it down to really understand. And it's this, again, it's, it's, it's a much more direct connection here to a benefit. No one buys something because they're 21. First drink, maybe, but that's a different thing. Right? <laughs> buys their first car, but come on, those are, those are sort of life stages here. Right? Milestones, the ongoing piece of it is here. And it really is the, the pointed end of what so much of segmentation has been about in the last number of years. Right? Understand, be able to communicate and articulate in your plan what it is that people value here. And it's, it's, I'm telling you, it's, not, it's not the same as a benefit, we'll get there, but this is, the, this is the reason people do things. This is the thing that's in their mind, and the beauty of it is it just cuts across so much of the other type things. Am I making sense? Right? Hard to get, though. Buy demographic data, you can cut it any way you want, you can get a map and a pen and you can stick with it geographically. This thing though, you really have to be in people's minds. And you really have to demonstrate and know your customer and that I think again is where it becomes so valuable. Now, down here, behavioral view. You, you read a lot of the marketing text and what they'll argue is that people buy things because of where they live, because of how old they are, because of their incomes, because of their psychographic mindsets, and that these things in some way cause this. I don't like it. I think they're correlated. I think they're correlated. Live up north, cold weather. 
I buy stuff associated with that. And then now I'm going to care for you, you buy certain things. <coughs> this is different. This is really how it is that people behave. If you're going to talk about a benefit, talk about a benefit, come back to Luke's examples of the portable music here. Right? You have to be able to make someone's life better because they're using your product or service. And if you're going to stand up here when you do your pitch or put down on paper and argue that you can make someone's life better, you damn well better know what that life is like now. Right? And that, I think, is where you really start to come down to the understanding. If you can demonstrate, you can articulate, right? communicate, here is some poor slob's life. Right? And this is what it looks like. These are the pathetic competitive offerings they have available to them. This is the money they waste. This is how inefficient their lives are. And if they just would adopt our product or service, this is what their life will look afterward. Right. Show me the movement. Right. Dialogue, day in the life of, accordingly. Right. Show me what someone's life is like. Right. Show me that you understand it. And then you can start to design a better product, manufacture it, price it, communicate it, and make their lives better. Right. This is really the pointed end of what segmentation is about. Right? Where I always go to when I'm reading the plans. So if I have the pleasure, and I won't actually, of, of going through and evaluating your plans, this is where I always start. Right? Number one, do you really understand someone's life? Right? Can you describe it to me? Right? And then can you show me how yours is going to make it better? Right? You should be able to do that in a few paragraphs. It's not that big a deal. But the first real test for me of whether you've done your due diligence is here. Any questions at this point? Now, how are you going to get this information? Because we kind of want to weave a little bit of the sort of the market research a little bit in place. I know mean, you've done some of it prior to your first submission. How are you going to get this? One thing. You can just sit there. Well, you can sit there behind the desk and say, oh, this is what someone's life is like. I, mean, I know this is what they're like. All right, yeah, okay, fine. You're going to be wrong. All right. how, do you, how do you identify someone's life? I didn't know what their life is like. You go outside and talk to them? No, that's a novel concept. <laughs> I can actually go and talk to them. Right? Budweiser. You mentioned beers, right? There's a few beers. <laughs> What's your brand? A beer? Yeah. Uh, Magic Cat. Magic Cat. Microbrew? Who owns that thing? One of the big ones, or it's still a micro? I think it might be independent. Yeah, cool. Huh? Yeah. I like hundreds of those things around. No, I like it a lot. How many beers a week do you drink? <laughs> Just go have your problem. <laughs> I'm a heavy drinker of wine. I drink two cases of wine a month. It's a bottle of night. Pretty much a bottle of night. Not just my, my wife's. <laughs> <laughs> sit down, have dinner. I cook the dinner. We open up a nice bottle of wine. She has a glass. I have three. It's pretty good. <laughs> pretty well. A heavy user, drinker of wine. Now, how many beers a week does a heavy drinker of beer drink? That is just below problematic. Actually, they're over the line. <laughs> How much? How many beers a week? Take a guess. Whatever you think it is, double it. <laughs> Seriously, it's 48. Yeah, it's 48. It's two cases a week. Two, two cases a week. Ouch. No, you think it's impossible. You're not working hard enough. Right? Look, is, is it six or seven a day? Yeah. No, it's not. Actually, how do they drink it? 24 a night. <laughs> <laughs> on Saturday and Sunday? Now nah, it's not quite so bad. How many do you have in a night? You go home and have a beer, right? Yeah, one or two. Yeah, okay. Come home, get in, you're tired, you have a beer. Right? Go and have dinner, have a beer. Maybe you have a third beer. Right? So that, maybe? Not on a school night. Not on a school night. Uh, <laughs> it's the right answer, but I don't believe it. <laughs> you're, you're, you're down here 10 beers, which means the remaining 30 beers get consumed when? Friday, Friday night, Saturday, Saturday, Sunday afternoon. What time is a beer? Is it, what time do they drink the first beer on Saturday? No, no, no! Come on! What, what, who are they going to drink it with? Number one, fishing. With fucking. <laughs> 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 it depends. We've got fishermen. It's one thing. If it happens to be the guys that are sitting on the couch watching, right? They're sitting with their buddies. Suburban America. The guys are going to show up at what time to watch the game? Noon. Because it starts at noon. Pre-show. He's a good host. He starts putting the food out at what time? 11.30, he looks up at the clock and he says, 11.30, man. Opens up a bag of chips, puts it in the bowl, eats a chip, and then he has what? A beer. A beer. And he says, what the hell? It's 5.30 someplace in the world. Right? And he has a beer. His buddies come in and what do they want? A beer. He has another one. Right? They'll, they'll drink for how long? Four or five hours? Two, two beers an hour, we're down ten beers. Next thing happens and we're done. 
right? Adding Friday night, Saturday, and Sunday. Show me that you understand your customers like that, right? Because look at what it does. Budweiser knows who you are, what are, you, what are they eating? Come on now, you don't salty have to gross me out. You're exactly right, they're eating chips and salty food, all of which makes them what? Thirsty. Thirsty. Life's good if you're Budweiser, right? Which is why all the ads are advertised on the sports shows. They know who the guys are with. They know who they're on down the line. Come on, show me that you know your customers that well. Now, how did Buzz Budweiser get to know their customer? I'm not making this shit up. This is real, right? So how does Budweiser know this? And then what? And then they watch and drink beer. Exactly right. Exactly right. Right? They stand in the distributors. They watch these guys buying a couple of cases of beer. They say, hi, I'm from Budweiser. We're interested in doing some customer research. What are you guys doing? How about next weekend I'll bring the beer? Just like to talk to you about beer. Okay, you're going to drive up in what? In front of this guy's house. A beer truck. A beer truck. <laughs> Budweiser. Beer truck, and then the neighbors are going to come over because what the hell's a beer truck doing? Right? And then you sit there, and after two or three beers, you're sitting there, and they're going to forget that you're with them. Budweiser, and then suddenly you're one of the buddies, and then they're going to watch how much beer you drink, how quickly you drink it, what you're eating, and they do that a thousand times, and they know this. How can you do that? Right? How can you get in front of your customers? Right? How can you? I know some of you are online. You're going to get all your data. You're going to get your calculations, you're going to get all that stuff. That's not the same. It's not the same as really understanding how people are using your product. Right? Dating sites don't work the way you think they work. Right? The, the attitudes, the behaviors, how long people stay online, come on, all that stuff. And you gather some of the data behind the <laughs> scenes from the metrics. Not the same thing as really being in someone's house, really being in their office. You need to focus on the behaviors. Because then you're going to turn around and you're going to tell me when they buy your product, they're going to behave differently and that their lives are going to be better. And that's the case that you have to make. I mean, am I making sense here? It's just make someone's life better based on this. <coughs> Eat a beer. But we'll go on. Now, <coughs> as you touched on a little bit and we've just been touching on, right, this is about understanding that your product right, offers a benefit. What is it that you're solving? We keep coming back to this all the time. And I would say one of the weakest parts in, in my experience um, has been the fact that you all have for many times really, quote, innovative ideas. You have innovative technologies. You have what I would describe, though, as different ways to do things. Understanding that something because it's different, though, doesn't necessarily mean it's better. It's better because it solves a problem that someone has. And the problem is not Right? The problem is not on this focus that the competitors aren't very good. Right? Don't, don't write in, gee, the problem is the competitive offerings aren't very good. The problem from your customer perspective is they can't do something. You see the distinction? Right? I, I get it. There's a, there's a set of offerings that are out there. Right? But the idea is because this is what's available, they can't do this. This is the problem. It's a gap in their life as opposed to a failing in the competition. You get the point. Same thing. It's the same thing, but we need you at this point anyway to be focusing on what it is in regards to the marketplace, and it is, I think, one of the hardest perspectives to really keep in mind here. Right, we're, we're, we, we beat it into you too, right? This whole idea of how you're different in the competition, what's your competitive advantage, come on, I teach all that crap too, right? And it works, it really does work, but you have to have that initial customer problem-solving orientation here. And then we'll back it down to how it is you're going to beat the competition, how you're going to sustain the advantage, and around the triangle here. Right. Talk, know your customers. Just, just got to know them. Go on, talk with them. Bring the beer. Tell us. Now, you have to have a section here somewhere along the line. And, and look, none of this is lockstep. I don't care. I don't think anyone cares. That, that you follow the sections particularly. Part of, I think, what is difficult is that we leave this thing open enough that you can screw it up. Right? We, we have gone back and forth about how strict to make the framework and make sure you do this and make sure you do that, and that's what I'm talking about. I don't care or necessarily believe that you have to have a section that says competition. On the other hand, I think it's probably a pretty good idea. Because anyone who's looking at the fact that you're going to try to sell a product or service is going to look at it from the perspective of who it is that you have to beat. <coughs> right? And 
whether it's a section or whether you embed it, up to you. Never, absolutely, positively never, <clears throat> do you say we have no competition. It's a kiss of death, and as soon as you say it in anything, no one will read further. Trust me. I don't care how good the plan is afterward. I don't care how good the idea is. It doesn't matter. If you say we don't have any competition, and then basically articulate that no one is doing it like we're doing it, you don't understand. All right? I want to know how much money people have. I want a part of it. They're spending their money already. Right? The money is going someplace already. It may be going there poorly. It may not be providing a whole lot of benefit. But in some way, there is some money that's being taken out of someone's wallet. There are a set of competitors who are taking the money away. Right? So if you want to argue, I don't have any direct competitors because no one is offering this particular technology at this point in time. All right. Don't put it up front. Because again, you're going to lose a lot of readers in the beginning. All right? But the fact is, if, if you develop a great new technology that really is cool, what do I know is going to happen six months later? Everybody else. Somebody's going to have it. And you're going to say, oh, no, 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 I'm going to have patent protection. Patent protection didn't protect Viagra. Right? It's never protected any pharmaceutical drug that's ever come out. They get their patents because it protects them from generic compound type things. But at the end of the day, pharmaceutical companies are competing based on fixing and alleviating a problem and delivering a benefit here. And all the thing that does is that no one does it exactly like you. It just means no one does it exactly like you. That's right, so why we keep coming back to the benefits here and just think about the pharmaceutical companies. Um, patents really important. They all spend a ton of money there. Um, but trust me, you're always going to find someone who's going to come in and do something along similar ways. You know, we have a very big tech transfer office here in NYU. Um, all the research faculty invent some amazing stuff this year. 